Open 59 with Chris Michael. And we're looking at a selfie that Chris took literally at the edges of space. And Chris, I could hear you, but nobody else could hear you. Tell us how in the world did this come about, this wild selfie? my base, I'll uh, take you up in a U2. And uh, well, it was an opportunity I couldn't pass up. Uh, a lot of people might know it from A uh, Bridge of Spies, the movie that just came out, Francis Gary Powers, one of our most important um, surveillance assets, still flying missions every day. So I went up to Beale Air Force Base and you know, it was, it was one of the great experiences of my life. And so you were in the military and that is how you founded Military.com. So briefly, tell us what was Military.com and what was the connection to community in Military.com? Okay, well, so just a little bit of background. So I used to fly as a navigator in P3s out of college, uh, hunted Soviet submarines, Russian submarines. Um, kind of on a lark, I ended up at business school and I was always interested in technology. I had my first computer in 1979, a Sinclair ZX80. And after I finished business school, I knew I wanted to be an entrepreneur, but I didn't have the idea. And um, I was drilling with VP65 in uh, Point Magoo in uh, 1999, and it hit me like a ton of bricks that the internet would be a great way to connect and empower military people, the 24 million people that have served. And so I quit my job and racked up credit card debt and uh, started military.com, which was uh, one of the earliest social networks. It wasn't the first, but it was you know five years before Facebook. Uh, we didn't even use the term uh, social networking back then. It was just a community. So that's that was the idea, and it's to connect, enable, and empower the military community. So it's still around today. I'm very proud. 17 years later. And then you uh, started something called Affinity Labs, and the common thread here was this notion of connection among among people, which still for marketers is very powerful today. Yeah, so uh, <clears throat> we could talk a lot more about the military.com story, which we did a little bit on the last show, but basically we raised a lot of money for the company um, and we learned a lot. I burned through all the cash, got fired, uh, came back as the CEO and we made a lot of mistakes in building online community, but we figured out some things and then it really started working. And I'd sold the company to Monster and I said to Monster, you know, um, we really should do this for other communities other than just military people because it was really working for the military and it didn't work out there so i left monster and started a company called affinity labs which was to take the lessons of military.com and roll it out to well we only got to 10 before i sold the company again but the idea was thousands of online community of uh, different verticals and different affinities and with the lessons that we learned and you know um those lessons proved to be true affinity was successful although we sold the company quickly um it, it was working. And I still believe, although that was you know 2008, uh, I think the idea for Affinity Labs would be very powerful today and somebody else could go do it. So what was the idea and what were some of the core lessons about building a community that you learned? Well, I think there, there's a number of things in play here. So one of them is what worked at military.com and we could talk about that. Um, but the other was because technology had evolved quite a bit since I started the company initially, we figured out a way to build communities very, very inexpensively on the internet. Well, in a way, uh, Facebook has done this a little bit. They've built community um, infrastructure. So anyone can build a page for their group or company or whatever, and it takes two or three minutes to do that or five minutes or whatever it might be. Um, think of Affinity Labs as some hybrid model. So something that looks a lot like military.com, which is a very robust um, piece of software with community and content and services. Well, imagine we figured out how to do that with its own brand and its own URL and its own website and its own management team. We figured out how to do one of those in three or four days. So instead of years and millions and millions or tens of millions of dollars at military.com, we can now do it in days and thousands of dollars around real communities. And eventually the idea was that people could build their own communities. Um, and so uh, it's more than just group management. It's, it's real community where people belong and, you know, lots of things. So. so how do you get the how do you get people to coalesce because these days you hear so much marketers are talking about personalization and one-to-one -one personalization and 
customer engagement. And at the end of the day, it's all around constructing some sense of community. And that's the challenge that marketers have. So how, what was the secret that you learned uh, back in those early days? Well, the, so, you know, you um, sent me a question ahead of time about like, how did we look at communities? And I'm going to take, I have like seven sort of factors that we use to look at which communities to launch because we could launch them very quickly. But I, I'll throw out an important distinction. And that is, I'm not a marketer, right? I ran a community that I cared about, the military community, and I did it for a a purpose and a mission and the company had a purpose and mission and that is to support people who served to get them access to their benefits so right at the very front of this thing is authenticity right this is where companies have had real challenges because the marketing team says we need to build a community you know or have a blog for our company and people don't always love that because it feels a little biased it feels a little less real and so the real challenge, and this was the challenge at Affinity, we were going to build a bunch of communities where I wasn't necessarily a member of that community. So we had to build authenticity right at the beginning. So. So the, okay. So so therefore, the question is, how do you build authenticity? If that's well, the key. Uh, well, so I can talk about that. Let me maybe I'll just step back a little bit and say, how did we think about launching communities? So you know, maybe there's like two groups of people. Maybe there's many groups, but two groups that might be interested in community. One might be, I'm part of a community or a company and I want to launch a community. Another might be, hey, Affinity Lab sounds like a good business. Maybe I want to kind of try to replicate that business. So I'll tell you how we looked at launching the community. So we had military.com, which was working, right? And we said, well, which are the next ones we want to launch? And we actually created a little formula where we would look at the size of an affinity group, you know, and then we would look at the like an affinity score. And that was kind of a a variety of factors, like how strong are the valence bonds, right? So is America a community? Well, America is kind of a community. I mean, we feel some sense of loyalty and connection to people, but it's so large and there's so many diverse segments. It's not, and the needs are so different. It's very difficult. So the affinity score would be quite low. Maybe your family would be a high affinity score. You have a lot of things in common. You might have unique needs, but the size is quite small. So we had to find that balance. Then we would look for, is there a sense of unique needs? So we started with uh, career affinities or job affinities because people need to get jobs in their vertical, right? So if you're a nurse, uh, nursing education, for example, and nursing jobs are a big thing, right? So imagine LinkedIn for nurses, right? So if there are unique needs in the community, like the military has very unique needs, they have special benefits programs that are complicated. So hey, if there's unique needs, that matters. Uh, see what's already there. So, you know, the beauty of Twitter today is um, actually, you know, the beauty of Twitter today is you can see where people seem to have interest, what verticals are there. I met a guy who founded a, one of the career colleges and he said he would start a career college with, based on what he saw in magazine racks. This is like 10 years ago. So if he saw lots of magazines around, um, I think he saw a lot of them around like cooking. So he created La Cordon Bleu. You know, interesting idea. See what's there. Is there activity already? That could be an opportunity. I just have a couple more. Um, oh, the other, to, the other successful modality was find a community manager to lead that community, a subject matter expert, someone who cares. Like, for example, our first community at Affinity Labs is Police Link. We found a guy who basically ran one of the largest police communities to run our community for us. So that was very, very helpful. And then we would come up with brand and then pre-populate the site and we'd roll out monetization and then we would start marketing it. So, um, I think all of those things matter, but if you're the person that says I have to do it for my company, you might, you know, it's a little easier finding the group because you know what it is, but it's probably a lot harder to find um, sufficient entertainment or utility to get people engaged. Yeah, and I think that's the big question. You can identify a community of people, but there may be other online communities that serve that group. Yes, that's true. And how do you, so how do you create sufficient value to encourage those people to actually participate in a meaningful way? It's a good question. Well, I think you're on to something really important. So one of the things we had talked about earlier was what mistakes people make. And this isn't just true for Affinity Labs or military.com or any online communities. It's true for a lot of businesses, but probably especially digital businesses. And that is you either have to be for, in the consumer space, you have to have high utility, right? Or uh, be very entertaining. If you are not either of those things or some combination of them, people have no time. It's like if the app is just sort of good, people don't care. Um, I would say LinkedIn is not entertaining, but LinkedIn has high utility, 
or they hope it has high utility. They're trying to do things that are engaging people more. You see the feed and people are trying to do stuff where you can endorse people. But I think it's actually not going that well for them. I think people are finding, they feel like they're being bothered by some content that's not relevant to them. Um, so in our case, we try to do some of both. So uh, entertainment, for example, at military.com, we had a shock and awe video section. We, people could upload videos or photos from the, from the field. So we broke the news of Saddam Hussein being captured. I didn't break it. It wasn't ABC News. It wasn't CNN. It was one of our members who was part of the capture team who uploaded a photo. People tuned in for that kind of content. It was super interesting. Uh, discussion boards were interesting to people. Humor is interesting to people. But the thing that got military.com and the Affinity Lab sites was we were high utility. If you wanted to use your GI Bill or VA loan or whatever, you would come to us. Right? Uh, there was a third piece, and that was community. We built the first sort of um, alumni infrastructure for all the military units, like 101st Airborne or Patrol Squadron 11. You could go there and find people you served with. So connecting with old buddies was important. Today, that's less relevant because Facebook does that pretty well. So, um, But you know, if, if you're at Clorox and you think you're going to build a community of people who use you know, Clorox products, good luck. I, I think that's going to be difficult. I mean, interesting, is CXO a community? Uh, CXO talk a community? I don't know. It's certainly utility. It's certainly some entertainment. Do those people feel affinity for each other? I don't know. It's an interesting question. And uh, I'm interested what people in, on Twitter think about that CXO talk as a community. It certainly serves. Is there a distinction between the community and affinity, because CXO Talk, for example, serves a group that has a, a, a set of common interests. Is there affinity or community among those people? I guess that's a, that's a, a separate question. Well, you know, there, there are natural affinities and then there are built affinities. So a natural affinity could be, you know, women in tech, you know. Um, a, or University of Illinois alumni or fraternity alumni group. So that, that's basically taking an analog group and creating a digital manifestation for it, right? So then there, there are communities that can be built over time. Those things usually are higher utility things, right? Like CPA to biz was an online community of uh, accountants. And they, they have tools for people to get you know, content. So could you build a community? I think you could build a community, but it would be not as straightforward, right? Because what are the unique needs of that group? Could there be a discussion board where people could discuss things? Yes, potentially. Um, do they want to, do, I mean, here's another element. Do they want to talk to each other or do they just want to receive content, right? Um, is CNN a community? Well, it's not really a community. There are people who consume the content. It's Twitter community. I don't know, you know, not really. Although there are certainly there are certainly pockets of Twitter that that there that people interact on a regular basis yes, and you're, you're right there are valence bonds between people, right? We have that's a very that's a very interesting idea, which is what's actually going on at Twitter. What if you could graph it, you'd probably see there are individuals that are, that are part of little communities that communicate with each other. Yeah, Twitter as one as one person I know describes it. Twitter is a uh, you can either use it a mile wide and a millimeter millimeter deep, or uh, very narrow and very very deep. And I guess it's when you go deep that you actually start to be, have a sense of community or camaraderie or affinity develop yeah. among yeah. the participants. Yeah. I think that that's right. Well, I, you know, Twitter's trying to figure it out themselves. And this, this is a, you know, it's interesting. So you started military.com. What, what was the year that you started it? 1999. And this problem, this question of, of affinity groups and, and communities remains absolutely as relevant today, even though the technology has changed. We have a question related to this from Arsalan Khan on Twitter. And he's coming back to this issue of how would you go about creating and engaging communities for enterprise business solutions? Um, how, what kind of ideas? Would you use blogs? How would you, how would you go about that? It's a practical question. Yeah, it's a practical question. Well, first of all, I would say uh, that is a hard problem. And, you know, have, I mean, maybe this is a question for you guys. Who has done it successfully and why have they done it, you know? Um, that wouldn't be, you know, you didn't ask me about my communities that I launched that failed. And there are a number of them that didn't work. 
And, um, you know, with enterprise solutions, it's tricky. Like what, what do those people have in common? What is it that they need? What is it that they want to talk about? I mean, is it sharing Dilbert cartoons? Is it that they want software? Is it they want reviews? Is it they want white papers? Is it they want jobs? Um, you know, do they make, does it make their jobs easier? Do they want to talk to each other? I mean, these are the questions that I would ask. Um, but I can't think off the top of my head about, you know, like does Slack software have like a community of people that are into Slack? Maybe, maybe people will implement it. Uh, maybe people want to get the most features out of it. Um, you know, cameras or Nikon have it easier because you have people that are passionate about the community, right? And there's gear that people like to talk about. So uh, from an enterprise point of view, I don't know, it's not, it's a tough problem. I, I mean, what I would say sitting on the board of some enterprise companies is companies should be careful about investing too much here because or, or they should at least be skeptical that they can actually build these communities effectively, right? So they should test for a while to see if it's working before they throw too much money into it. So, so essentially the, the community building task, what some people have said is, and you, you alluded to this earlier, is that it doesn't make sense to start, or it's very hard, let me say, to build a community from scratch. And I guess that would fall under the category of artificial, uh, creating artificial affinity that you mentioned earlier, as opposed to looking to where there are natural affinities that exist. But it seems any place that there are natural affinities that exist, if it's in the commercial market, chances are somebody is already trying. Somebody's yeah, already well, trying let, to let, do it. Let's go back to what I said earlier. So let's apply the Chris Michael product manager test. Is, it, is there high utility around the community or is the, is the content highly entertaining? If it is not either of those things, you have an uphill battle. So you can apply that to anything, right? Absolutely. I mean, one of the things that we have been focused on recently at CXO Talk is creating videos that have real practical value. Think you go on to YouTube and you want to learn about yeah. lenses. How, how does a particular lens function or take it apart? I, I say yeah. that because you're, of course, a, a photographer. And there's very high, there may not be any entertainment value, but there's very high utility value. Brother, you've, you've nailed YouTube. So this, the, the CM test, again, applies to almost all internet products. YouTube, to me, seems to be either A, highly entertaining content of people singing songs, doing dances, you know, squirrel, squirrel suit jumping, or B, things that teach you things like how to fix your sink or um, how to do math or whatever it might, you know, how to play a certain song on the piano or a camera review, right? So it's either utility or entertainment. Everything else is kind of wasting people's time. So if, so the implications, if you are a brand, if you're a company, you're a marketer, and I know you don't, you're not a, you don't see yourself as a marketer. You see yourself as somebody who actually will, I should, how do you see yourself? You're not a marketer. So how do you see yourself in that, in that way? Mm, as a photographer? I don't know. Well, certainly when you were with military.com, you, you were part of that affinity group, that military. Yeah. So I, I guess I thought of the, the internet as a, as a kind of tool, but the mission was well beyond the internet. The mission was to make the lives of military people, veterans and their families better. And we used a variety of tools, but the internet enabled a lot of those. So this is back to the authenticity, but you know, we could, you know, if we wanted to, as a case study, you could pick any product or any brand and we could noodle through, is there anything here? What we might find for the ones where there isn't high entertainment or high utility, we have to carve something out that is interesting for people, that doesn't sound like a waste of their time, that isn't just PR. Um, you know, part of it might be we're listening to people about what can make our products better. That's a way to engage people. You know, if you're really listening, I heard Apple now is not going to start to, to do Twitter customer support. They weren't doing that for a long time. They, they had no engagement. And I think it's a good idea. I think brands that listen, you know, I, I tweeted something United. I got a message right back from those guys. And, you know, it was the only time I've had a positive United Airlines experience. And it was about my photos. I took a photo from outside the window and they say, you know, we love, our, our birds love when you, you take photos. And I thought it was really clever and nice. It's just uh, speaking of United, I have had, uh, I've tried, been sometimes tried to take photos and have, and have had uh, flight attendants very clearly told me that that's not allowed. So I guess you happen to hit it, hit a good one. I shot out the window. Okay. 
So let's, uh, in, in a moment, let's look at some of your photos, which are just extraordinary. You have these uh, two different parts of your life. One is as an, as an entrepreneur and the other is as a photographer. But any last final pieces of advice, maybe talk about this notion of authenticity, because it seems like it's central to the whole, to the whole thing about building a community and getting a community engaged. Well, you know, when we think about authenticity, it, I, I'm, gonna, I'm going to bring it all the way down to who's touching the customers. So let's say the CEO is authentic and they said, or, you know, and they said, well, we really want a blog or we want a community for whatever it might be for Canon cameras. You know, who you have running that community is the person that has to be authentic, right? So it probably needs to start at the top, but it's, it's the person that's there. And if you've hired someone for $70,000 a year and they're just going through the motions, it isn't going to work, even if you have high affinity. We saw it at Affinity Labs. We saw that there was huge variability in the quality of the community based on who was leading the community. This is nothing new, but, you, you know, I guess the point is you, you just can't, like, you know, write a check and hope it happens. So who you find and making sure that they really are passionate and engaged. I mean, think about your show. You know, who the host of the show is matters a lot, right? If you're like, oh, I'm just going to hire somebody to go do it, probably doesn't work, right? They might show up every day, but um, so I, I would get to that and then ask yourselves the tough questions. Am I being for real? Am I helping people? And do they like it? And then if it's not true, you're optimizing. I mean, I don't know. We could take the Twitter streams of a lot of brands and think, they're not doing themselves any favors. Am I helping? Am I, am I serving this? That gets to the utility, both to utility and the entertainment quality that you mentioned. And maybe like, even, are you real? Like part of being real is acknowledging when you're not perfect. You know, I think people would love it. I think that's one of the big ideas in brands where people go, you know what, we can do better and we will do better. If, you know, it's like when Apple tells me everyone loves their Apple watch, I think Apple is not telling the truth. Right? That's PR, that's inauthentic PR that is damaging them. I want to hear from them, hey, you know what? The watch is really for early adopters. We're going to do a lot better, and we're learning a lot. So this notion, so authenticity has a lot to do with being honest and acknowledging your flaws. Yeah. That's a pretty simple concept, and yet it seems to be very, run very Ooh. deep. It's elusive. Well, it's also true with people. You know, you see a lot of people that are working very hard to put on a kind of front to not be vulnerable. But vulnerability is one of the most powerful things that humans can, can show. When you're vulnerable and you talk about your mistakes, um, people like it and they appreciate it and they connect with you. And um, when you don't do that, people don't feel connected and they don't feel like you're authentic and they can't, you know, they don't want to support you. And people who know how to do that effectively really... Um, I think live better lives and are much more effective. I mean, I, I didn't always do that in my early days at military.com. I was a very young CEO and I felt like I had to put a show on and it didn't work. People didn't trust me as much. And I learned over the years that uh, being real and authentic and connecting with people and, and really caring about them and, uh, really led to a, a community and culture of trust. So when a brand actually cares, a brand is comprised of, we think about a brand as being this abstraction, right, this abstraction. But in fact, a brand, especially when it's interacting with its customers, is a group of individuals. And so if that group of individuals demonstrates that they care, acknowledges when there's a screw up or a problem with the brand, but then at the same time, the brand has to have uh, policies that give the people working there the flexibility yeah. to do that. Yeah, you're totally right. That's actually probably one of the biggest issues. And this is where it gets hard. When you delegate your PR to a lot of people, you're basically going to get the corporate line all the time. Like you're never going to see a politician say anything, you know, or a politician's uh, Twitter team say anything that doesn't sound incredibly positive, right? Uh, it, you have to have confidence and authority to be able to communicate the truth. Uh, but some, I mean, I guess some organizations, you know, they delegate that a little bit. They have the right people, but it's hard. This is where I, I would argue for the value of the principal being involved in communications, right? I like Steve Jobs um, saying, here's the truth, right? He wasn't, you know, he didn't always do that. But, he, but one thing we knew about Steve was, you know, whatever quality bar we had, he had an even higher bar. And that was part of his genius. 
Well, he was, he was obviously a rare person because he was able to get the sense of, of uh, the deep sense of the culture and then create products that address those needs, even if we in the masses didn't know that we had those problems. Yeah, yeah. Well, I rem it reminds me of a funny video I once saw. I was at a conference and Bill Gates was there. And he, he and his, this is near the end of his term as the CEO of Microsoft, but he made a kind of funny video. It was a Napoleon, you can probably find that on YouTube, it was a Napoleon Dynamite video where he's in a dream and wakes up with Napoleon Dynamite and they have to go to Napoleon's job and he's uh, typing in the Microsoft activation code. Bill is typing in the Microsoft activation code for like a piece of software and he couldn't ever get it right. Do you remember how long those, it's like a 40 yes. digit, you know? And he's like, I can't enter this. And you know, I loved that. I think people started to see Bill as a real person and that the company acknowledged that they do some silly things. And I, I don't know, see, worked for me. So these are the, these are the lessons that, that you learned that you, I, I suppose you, kind of learned the hard way because you were figuring it out at the time and there weren't many examples when you started military.com. Yeah, yeah. Well, that was the beauty of Affinity Labs. It was like, we figured out the business model and then we scaled it with Affinity. So speaking of business models, tell us about your photography. Your photographs are so great. So tell us about, tell us about why you take photos. What's, what's on your mind? What's the common theme? Um, well, you know, instead of, well, I guess I started Nautilus Ventures after Affinity Labs, but instead of doing another company as the CEO, I really thought about what it is I really wanted to do in the world, and that's kind of create art and have incredible experiences. And so for me, photography is my e-ticket to the world. So I have gotten to go a lot of places, uh, to the edge of space, uh, deep in the sea, to both poles, to the jungles of Papua New Guinea. I'm just back from Congo. Um, I've gotten to go a lot of places and see a lot of things and meet a lot of people and learn every single day because of my camera and my interest in telling stories. So it is not about the photos, really. It's mostly about the experience. And, you know, I really hope for everyone out there to think about photography um, in that way, because I, I think it can be a big part of a lot of people's lives in a way that's very additive. And, you know, the net result is you're creating art. You're creating some art that may matter. And especially when you do portraiture, you know, when I take your photograph and I give you that picture, it's valuable today to you and your family, but it's only going to get more and more valuable over time. So it's a kind of alchemy. And, um, you know, to me, maybe it's a kind of legacy. Okay. Let's look at some photos. How's that? Okay. Let's do it. Okay. All right. Okay. So... I hope everybody can see. Obviously, that is at the top of the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco. How does one get to the top of the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco, San Francisco to take a photo? <laughs> um, was it scared? Was it scary? <laughs> and uh huh. And did it to great engineers and builders and designers and and did uh, you had to hold on to the the camera so it didn't fall? Okay, so pretty tightly. Let's look at the. Uh, at the next one, the uh, picture, where was this and what's the story of this? It looks like kind of the archetypical desert, you know, island in the middle of the Pacific.
on his G500 Gulfstream, and we flew uh, from Teterboro, New Jersey, to our first stop, which is the Majuro Islands, um, or the Marshall Islands in a place called Majuro. And uh, this is one of the little island groups as we went by to go deep sea fishing. So it was a really cool experience. Um, and although I will say this is the kind of place that you re I remember from Gilligan's Island that I always wanted to live on. But in practical terms, you, you might not actually want to live on these islands. Well, it certainly is beautiful. And yes. we have coming up, what is this? It takes uh, like about five seconds. For oh, okay. So I don't see it's, it. it's the... I, I still see the island. Well, this is another one of clouds and it's clearly the water with layers of clouds. Yeah, so this is the opposite side of the world. So this is, I, I just recently came back from an outside magazine shoot in uh, at the North Pole and I left Murmansk in the only surface vessel that's capable of reaching the North Pole, which is the 50 years of victory nuclear Russian icebreaker. And um, uh, we were passing through Franz Josef land uh, on the way to the pole. And this is, you know, like 81 degrees north. And you see lenticular clouds there and a very beautiful place. Pretty wild. Um, you have a lot of cameras. Do the, does the camera matter? Well, um, I have an unusual answer. I would say uh, no and yes. So no, it doesn't matter in the sense that um, I've seen incredible iPhone pictures. Some people say the best camera is the one that you have with you. I've seen point and shoots do amazing, amazing work. Um, but what people often notice is um, unusual pictures. And these are really either wide angle pictures or animal photographs or uh, night photography. And a lot of those require some specialized equipment. Um, I'm looking right now at a, a, a church photograph um, from Iceland that was taken with a wide angle camera. So, uh, or a wide angle lens. It's probably a 16 millimeter lens on a Nikon. And um, so I guess it matters in that way. I oftentimes shoot very narrow depth of field portrait photos and uh, those require a very special lens, um, a 50 millimeter F, 0.95 lens. So um, what you often find is that people with good cameras carry them around a lot more. And people that carry their camera with them and take a lot of photographs produce good work. People who do not do, do that don't get the picture. Sometimes they're lucky. Um, and I'll say there's one other cost to all of you out there that think your iPhone pictures are great. They may be great, but oftentimes because they're so cheap, meaning you can take them anytime and you just keep them on your phone. I think that they have a real risk of being lost over time and they don't get synced. They don't get saved. They don't get printed. They don't get post-processed. So I'm a big fan of being very intentional about your photos. Uh, this was taken with a Leica. Um, I think it was the 50 millimeter F.95 at Ocean Beach. So you can see the very narrow depth of field in the picture. So uh, this woman's um, Sarah is in focus and everything behind her at sunset is blurred. So it's, so at the end of the day, it's not about the equipment, but you may need special equipment, special camera lens in order to take certain types of photos. Yes, so I guess I would say it's primarily about the intentionality of taking photos. So if you have that intentionality and you're committed to doing it, you will get good photos. And it doesn't matter what equipment you use. Some equipment's better than others. And some equipment, like if you're going to go to Africa and you're using a point and shoot, it isn't going to work. Uh, you might say, well, you can get a couple good pictures. But if the animals are far away, it'll be difficult. Uh, this photo that I'm looking at is um, one of my favorite places on Earth. It's Torres del Paine National Park in Chile, Patagonia. Pretty amazing. Um, now, are penguins as friendly and as cute as they look? Uh, in a word, yes. Um, they, I, I mean, I, I love penguins. I've taken a lot of photos. This is probably one of my most famous photos. It was on the front page of uh, National Geographic's website, um, I don't know, maybe a year ago. This was taken on my trip to the South Pole in a place called Gould Bay, and I had to work hard for this photo. I uh, was laying down 
um, at this kind of opening on the ice and the penguins are quite happy. You know, they march, we've all seen March of the Penguins. They march 70 miles back and forth. Well, if there's a lead opening up in the ice, they can get food. And um, so I was very, very close to the penguins shoot, shot with a wide angle lens. So I was maybe like two feet away or a foot away. He was quite surprised to see me or she was quite surprised. Um, and, you know, when I approached this colony for the first time, five penguins came right up to me and just circled me about two feet away and just were fascinated. Uh, on my last day with these penguins, uh, two of the penguins walked two miles back with me to camp, just followed me all the way. And when I'd stop, they'd stop. And when I went, they would go, you're curious, interested people that don't have a lot, a lot of land predators. So uh, maybe only the leopard seal. So they're, they're uh, interested and they are so cute. And you said they're curious, interested people. Did they feel like people to you? Did you feel yeah. like like you? Well, the fact I said that is a kind of you know anthropomorphication of these creatures, uh, but that's why we love them because they're they're kind of ridiculous, sweet, cute looking humans. They waddle around. I mean, they're birds. They're birds, but they don't act like normal birds. They act like curious little creatures. Ex extraordinary. So this one. Yeah, so this is actually related to the previous photograph. So to go to the South Pole is tricky unless you're there, we're going with the government. So there's a company uh, called ANI um, that takes people down there. So this is an IL-76 Russian military aircraft uh, designed for landing on the tundra. And I used it to fly from Punta Arenas to um, Union Glacier Ice Camp, a tent camp. And it's just landed on the ice. There's no runway there. It's just a blue ice runway. And we're going to uh, disembark here, go to our tents, and then I'm going to get in some uh, Ken Boric uh, twin otters to fly either to the penguins or the South Pole. So you mentioned earlier when you were at the North Pole that you were on, I think you said a Russian icebreaker. And this is a Russian plane that's designed for landing on ice. Is there something about the Russians that they are really into this type of exploration, or is it just coincidence? Well, I don't know this, but what it appears to me is the Russians will sell access to things. So uh, the Russian nuclear icebreaker is a working icebreaker. You know, it's run by Ross Adam Float, which is sort of associated with the Russian government. As we know, uh, Soyuz will sell you a seat on a you know, mission to space. Uh, the U.S. government does not do that. You cannot buy your way aboard a U.S. Navy warship. So um, I think that there is a little something about their equipment being available. And oftentimes it takes military-like equipment to go to these very extreme places. Okay. Uh, for our next photo, which is coming up, obviously a very different kind of place from the cold to what I imagine is pretty darn warm. Zebras. Yeah, zebras. Uh, this is in uh, Kenya, the Maasai Mara, uh, the lands of the Maasai. And um, it was just a beautiful late afternoon. And these uh, three zebra were just walking. You can see the, the lone tree in the distance. And I really liked it. I, li I like the sort of color and contrast here and the camaraderie, the three musketeers. I also like the way that you kind of uh, overexposed it a little bit. It just... Yeah gives a beautiful feeling. It's and kind of ethereal. Say again? It's kind of ethereal. You it know? is. It almost seems like not quite real. Now, I imagine that you look like you're pretty up close with this gorilla, or maybe maybe you were using a telephoto lens, but I imagine the gorilla experience is a little bit different from the penguin experience. So I just took this photo. So this was taken about four weeks ago. And um, I had a chance, I was on assignment for the American Refugee Committee and IDEO.org shooting um, sort of hospitals and water facilities in uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo, which as you probably know, is a very, very dicey place. And it was a, a quite a remarkable and interesting and scary and wonderful experience. Um, one of those days I left kind of that work and went um, hiking in the jungle um, with a guide and we went to see the lowland eastern gorillas, which are the largest in the world. So it was about a two hour hike and uh, it was me and a friend and uh, these three guides with machetes cutting our way through the jungle. And we got right up to this guy. So I would say we're six, seven feet from him. And he, we got closer because he came right up to us. Mm -hmm. And we have another photo of 
a gorilla, which is so interesting because it looks like he's looking just directly at you. Okay, well, I see the same gorilla. Okay. Looks, looks like he's flossing. Mr. Mr. or Ms. Uh, second gorilla is coming up right now. Oh, uh, yes. So this is the baby. So the baby is a little bit further. Baby's maybe uh, 15 feet. And uh, I can't tell you if it's a he or she, but she's pretty cute. And speaking of pretty cute, some of these, uh, your, your portraits are just so breathtakingly lovely, like this one. I just love this one. A little, um, looks like, a, I'm not sure if it's a boy or a girl with a, a pot over his or her head. Yeah, you know, you, um, nobody listening would know this, but you just pick these photos from like a big set of photos. So, uh, you know, I'm pleased that you picked this one. So, um, uh, you know, so there's like 20 years of photographs. Interestingly enough, you've been picking photographs of recent trips, which makes me feel like I'm doing better work. So mm -hmm. thank you. This was just taken, and this was taken, interestingly enough, coming back from the gorillas. So you picked it randomly, but um, as we were coming back through this little village, it started raining, actually it started raining, unfortunately, when we were with the gorillas. And so we were in a kind of, you know, downpour with all my camera equipment. And as we we're coming back, I saw this little kid um, using a, it uh, looks like a pan or, a, or something as a uh, kind of umbrella. So just cute beyond cute. Yeah. And when you take photos of kids or you take photos of adults portraits, uh, how do you go about doing it? Do you, do you, how do you, because a lot of people would be shy to go and ask, and obviously you're not doing it behind these people's back. They're looking right at you very close. Yeah. So, you know, you could put uh, photos into a couple categories. So one photo category would be uh, people know that I'm taking their photo of them, right? So in these two shots, people know that I'm taking their photo. And then the other one where they don't know. So this is like general street photography or, you know, landscape or whatever it might be where the, if there's humans in the picture, they don't know that their photos are being taken. And there's a place for both. Um, but I shoot a lot of very narrow depth of field photography, which means the focus has to be really perfect and I'm close to the subject. So in those cases, um, I go up to people, I, they see the camera, I smile at them. Um, and if they don't want their photo taken, they often are communicating at this point, they don't want their photo taken. But sometimes you don't know what they're thinking and I take a photo and then I show them the photo. So in this case, this boy knows because he's seen some of the photos that I've taken of him and he wants to get his photo taken more. So that experience is very common where there's some trepidation, they see the photo, they get into it, and then they're really into it and want a lot more photos. And so there's a communication that's, that's even if it's not verbal, there's a communication that's taking place between you and the person that you're photographing. Absolutely. Absolutely. So do these people know that they're getting their photo taken? Uh, I don't know that they do. They probably will know shortly because I think they turned around and, um, but I just thought it was a really cute photo. Another, is, total, it's a totally cute photo. This is taken, I mean, again, another Congo photo. This is taken in one of the villages in uh, DRC. Mm -hmm. And now, so now we have somebody that is older and uh, maybe India or, or you tell us, where, where was this one taken? So this is um, in Rajasthan. And uh, one of my favorite things to do is just go with my camera into little villages and I'm just wandering the streets and I see this woman sitting inside of her home and I go up to the doorway and wave and smile and she smiles. And, you know, that's kind of, it's, you know, she's okay with having her photo taken. So uh, I just take the picture. I step into her home. I take the photograph and then I show her the photo and uh, she'd probably be surprised. We're talking about her right now on, on the internet. And this one is an, another woman and yet obviously a completely different, environment and I thought the contrast between the two it's pretty extraordinary so this is this is pretty unusual so I don't do this very often this is a photo shoot so um, this was styled uh, we had um, a set person work on it and we had a creative person kind of come up with the idea and it was okay. taken in my uh, living room oh okay already another one a comp that is a, a completely different environment, maybe Vietnam or Cambodia or Thailand. So tell us about this one. Uh, yeah, I love this photograph. So this was taken in Yangon in Myanmar and I just arrived. So uh, the, this is the old Rangoon and I'm walking through the old city and it's raining. And 
uh, it's like midnight and I, I was there with a friend of mine and she's like, let's go back because it's so late. And I'm like, no, this is incredible. And what I love about this photograph, not just the lighting, but it's the juxtaposition. So there's old Yangon, old Myanmar, old Burma, you know, these people cooking and selling food on the street. And then you can see in the background a BMW. And this is what I'm seeing all over the world is the old and new are, are meeting right in the cities. And, uh, you know, we know who's going to win, sadly, there. Yes, and here we come to back the, uh, the most outrageous selfie in the world, you up at the edge of space. And you spoke about that briefly earlier, but we also have some kind of behind the scenes looks, behind the scenes photos. For example, these look like two fighter pilots, I suppose. Uh, let's see, well, I still see myself. Uh, we'll see when they come, when they come up. Okay, yeah, so uh, um, I was there for a week doing training, or maybe five days doing training, and one of the things I did during training was take photographs of U-2 pilots. And um, these are two guys just flying in the U-2. They just come back from a flight, and um, they're kind of, you know, I call it the hero shot. Uh, uh, Captain Tull is the guy on the left, and um, it's a general on the right. Mm -hmm. And they're, they're standing in front of U2 at base operations. Um, so one of my favorite things about my U2 experience is it's really a kind of Apollo space experience. Uh, it's the same kinds of people. It's the same spacesuits. They have me in a Barco lounger. You have to like, uh, you know, eat low residue food. You're, you eat and drink stuff through a tube and you can see me drinking kind of a Gatorade as they're preparing me for the launch. And something tells me that this next one Although it looks like you're in a lazy, boy, a lazy boy recliner, something tells me that there's something else going on here than relaxing watching TV. Yeah, so this is very, I mean, there are only a few places in the world like this. You know, it's probably like Cape Canaveral in here. Uh, and I, you know, I've been to Russia and I've seen the, you know, I did a photo shoot with a Soyuz launch and it's not quite like this, but maybe similar. Um, so it's a multi-hour process to get ready. It's very exhausting. It's hot in the spacesuit. So basically what you see is, this is kind of the dressing, dressing um, chair and they dress me, I'm now sealed up. I've uh, outgassed all my nitrogen. You have to do a thing where you're breathing oxygen on a treadmill. They have me hooked up into a coolant air system. So I would suffocate if I was not hooked into a air coolant system. And so that's kind of what's going on there. I see another photo here. This was taken in Telluride. Um, just me walking down the street, seeing a BW bus. And the thing is with your portraits, the common thread that I see is there is this warmth. I mean, you look at this, they're very, very, very good natured photos. And I think the photos, oftentimes you see photos that people take and they're an expression. The photo is an expression of who that person is, if it's art. And these are so good natured, all of your photos. Well, thank you. Well, you know, I mean, part of it is people are reflecting. So I'm smiling and I, I just think this is a delightful moment. And you know, when you're smiling, it's a delightful moment. And this guy is like, he knows he's cool. He's driving around in an awesome VW bus with a canoe. And, he, you know, we have a kind of moment where we both acknowledge each other. And, uh, and I never spoke to him. He, he doesn't know anything about this photo other than he knows that some guy took his picture. Mm -hmm. uh, do you know who this is? Well, of course, Om Malik. Yes, it's Om, a good friend of mine. I've taken many, many, many friend, uh, photos of... Uh, this famous writer and venture capitalist and friend. There's a question from Constance Woods on Twitter. Do you have opinions or thoughts on Periscope, live streaming, video apps, that kind of thing? Um, well, it's interesting. Uh, Meerkat and Periscope, um, I don't use it. Um, and every time I've tried to watch one of those things, I've always missed it. because I'm not you know, uh, following real time on Twitter. Um, so I don't know if I have that much. People are into it, I guess. Um, I like uh, asynchronous content uh, consumption a little bit more unless there's breaking news. Um, you know, there's lots of other services if you mean like Instagram or uh, those things are pretty cool. Uh, photos on Twitter, pretty cool, especially when there's something going on in the world and you want the content. You know, I was sadly around during um, uh, a explosion of a balloon that blew up right near me in Luxor, Egypt, killing 20 people. Mm. And I tweeted it with a photo and it got global quickly. 
And you know, that's the that's the exciting thing about that technology is you know we no longer turn to the news to see what's happening in the world because someone, some citizen journalist is covering it. Mm -hmm. So this I, next one. Yeah. So, uh, well, you know, I don't know what's coming up in the sequence, but this was uh, me walking in the mission in San Francisco and I see uh, these people walking and they're dressed uh, a bit unusually, but maybe not for San Francisco, uh, a bit steampunky and they were going to a wedding. And uh, there's a picture I have that you probably don't, I don't know if you have it, but it's a kind of uh, robust woman and her fiance uh, that's part of the wedding party. That's the other shot from this set. I did see it. it was pretty interesting. Yeah. yeah. And so another one, a gentleman with handlebar mustache. Oh, I'm glad you picked this photo. I didn't know you were going to pick this. So uh, this, is, this photo has an interesting, um, interesting story. Um, so I was at Blue Bottle where I spent a lot of time and I see this guy. So, you know, you know, I'm a portrait photographer. And when I see interesting people, I feel compelled to take their photograph, even when it's difficult. And I said to him, do you mind if I take your picture? And he said, no. And you can see he's delighted and we have this great shoot. Uh, I take the, I don't know, this photo was taken, I don't know, seven years ago. Two years ago, somebody's looking at this photo and they say, do you know who that is? And I'll ask you, Michael, do you know who that is? You know, it was, I saw you put it on uh, Facebook or something and I forget his name, but the per a major bicycle builder. Yeah, so it turns out it's Gary Fisher, who's one of the founders of mountain biking. And, but that's the interesting thing about taking photographs is you don't always know who you're taking photos of. Sometimes it's a celebrity and you wouldn't even know. In fact, I, you know, I, I've, I've had that experience where I've taken photographs of people and they've turned out to be, as you can see here, uh, well-known people, but I, I'm the last person that would recognize a celebrity. So. Mm. Um, I, this guy, I don't know anything about him. He's just a Cafe Trieste. It's one of my many Cafe Trieste portraits. So you, so when you come across people that are interesting looking, you stop and you ask, hey, can I take your photo or how does- Well, I don't think this, I think it's quite likely he doesn't know that I've taken his photo. In that, in that case. I don't know that he doesn't, but this was taken a long time ago. Do you know who this is? Uh, Stan Chud Chudnovsky. Well done. So this is my good friend, Stan, who is uh, one of the driving forces behind Facebook Messenger and probably the best engineer growth hacker in technology and one of my closest and dearest friends. And of course, we all know who this is, but tell us the story of how you got in the position to take a photo of coming up the Dalai Lama. Um, Stan is the Russian Dalai Lama. So, um, well, remember I said that, uh, that photography is the e-ticket ride. Um, you know, you take a lot of pictures and people know you as a photographer and maybe they trust you. And um, a guy who runs the Dalai Lama Center for Ethics at MIT is a, he's a monk, Tenzin. Tenzin asked me, he said, Chris, you know, um, His Holiness is coming to MIT for three days. Would you be um, His Holiness's photographer? And uh, I got to do that. So I spent three days uh, uh, intimately connected to the Dalai Lama in his hotel room next to him. And uh, it was a very, very interesting experience. And what was that? What, what, are, what are your strongest memories or, or uh, sensations about that experience being so close to the Dalai Lama for several days? Well, I, I'd say that there's two categories. One is uh, I've always been a fan of His Holiness. Uh, but sometimes you're a little worried about meeting super celebrities because maybe they'll disappoint you, right? You know, if you have such a high uh, set of expectations, like a movie or anything else, maybe maybe he would turn out to be not as authentic and not as nice. I mean, some super celebrities are like that, right? They don't have time for people. And um, it turned out that was unfounded worry. Um, I observed him off the record all the time. I saw him uh, in places where no other one is near him. And he is as gentle and as kind and as interesting and as thoughtful and treats everyone from the house cleaner to uh, Sting the same way. And I saw all of that. You know, I saw all of that. And he is really a wonderful person. The other category is, um, you know, I'm kind of Buddhist and I'm kind of Buddhist because of my experience with the Dalai Lama. And it isn't that I'm particularly religious, but it's that he espouses uh, Buddhism as a kind of secular ethics, as an approach or a technology for living your life and being happier. And, um, you know, there's a reason he spends a lot of time with scientists. 
because he, he really couples science and theology and philosophy in a way that I find very compelling. And this final photo I just thought was kind of a cute photo of the Dalai Lama wearing an MIT hat. Well, you know, he's a funny guy. So uh, humor is a big part of everything that he does. Uh, he meets leaders, he touches them, he tickles them, he laughs, he's having a good time. And, you know, um, to me, there is something really to be learned here, which is you can be famous and well-known and be involved in serious things. And he's involved in incredibly serious things. Look at all the things happening in Tibet. Uh, many people look up to him, but he's still having fun. He's still smiling. He has joy in his life. And it's a lesson for me and for many of us. Well, speaking of interesting experiences, this has certainly been a very interesting experience for me. And we've had a lot of people watching. And so I just want to say thank you, Chris, for taking the time today. Oh, it's my pleasure. It's an honor to be here. We have been speaking with Christopher Michael, who is an entrepreneur, an investor, he's a photographer. And you know, those are attributes and mostly he's just a really good guy, really nice guy. And you have been watching episode number 159 of CXO Talk. Chris, thanks again for, for taking the time today for speaking with us. Thank you. Next week, we are going to be talking with Anil Bushri, who is the CEO of Workday, a hot company these days. So please come back next Friday. And again, thank you to Chris Michael and especially thank you to everybody who joined us today. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.